text for today from that uh, psalm for today. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. Let us pray. Lord God, our loving Heavenly Father, as you bring us together in worship this day, again we thank you for your incredible grace and love to us through your Son, Christ our Saviour. As we meditate on this word, you gave through the psalmist so long ago a profound word that reflects on our life in this world. We pray sanctify us in your truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Psalm 139 is one of those uh, beautiful psalms within the scriptures. O oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. And it's a word that's been a, a word of comfort for many people throughout the ages because it has that word and we'll reflect on it a little bit later about where might I flee your spirit. Uh, and this particular psalm, if you look at it uh, within the psalms themselves in the Bible, uh, sits in the context of other psalms where people are lamenting their situations, they find some difficult circumstances. And this psalm is no exception because it speaks about later on the wicked uh, as well too. But the main part of this psalm is really a psalm that reminds us wherever we are travelling in the journey of life, God is with us. No matter the situation we are in, God is with us. Now, as I come to the psalm for today, I'm going to use the illustration of uh, people who sometimes live in conflict. And the reason I'm using that particular illustration uh, is that our first reading for today has the account of Jacob's dream at Bethel. Uh, and the context of that, of course, uh, is Jacob's dispute with his family, which is multi-layered. Now when it comes to conflicts, uh, and many people have had to deal with conflict in their life at various levels, conflicts are very multi-layered. I said it before, by the way, that uh, not all conflict is bad. You know, when you come together in a meeting, you're in some sort of work situation, and people have different ideas about the way to achieve the best outcome. And so you've got a conflict of points of view. And in most of these situations, people seek to work together for a positive outcome. Uh, and conflict resolution, by the way, is very important in marriage and home life. You know how it is, uh, I don't know if you've ever had that conversation at home, you know, what do you want for a meal tonight? And one person will say something and someone will say something else. You have a preference or do you want to go out or do you want to stay home and so on. Uh, and life is always about dealing with different ideas or conflict resolution. And in those situations when you've got good communication, an agreed set of values and beliefs, you can usually work towards positive outcomes. So not all conflict is bad. But I was having a chat to uh, someone this past week. Uh, they actually were having a chat with me about a situation they found themselves in of a conflict situation they were dealing with. Uh, and the illustration they used is, you know how sometimes in a marriage or a relationship or somewhere, or at school or at home or at work, people have a fight over something that seems to be rather trivial. And yet it creates an argument that goes on. And uh, undoubtedly, you're probably aware of some, even in the life of church congregations, where someone gets upset about something uh, and most people think, what are they upset about? And they might even say, I'm never going to come to church again because of whatever that little thing was. But usually behind those sorts of conflict lies other issues. The couple who argue about which way the toilet roll should go in the, in the, in the, in the, um, in the loo or who argue about where the uh, toothpaste should be squeezed and thank God for plastic... Um, toothpaste holders, now not the old metal ones, you know what I mean? And all those sorts of things, usually you will find that behind that when people argue over trivial things, there are other things there. It might have to do with their family of origin. It might have to do with 
what's going on with their body physically and the way that they are thinking at that particular time. It might be that they're dealing with other issues elsewhere which are really labouring the heart. And so this little seemingly trivial point is really a spark that unpacks greater and deeper issues. And so it's important to realise that sometimes when people explode over something, behind it is usually something else. And you might not be able to do it in that immediate situation. Sometimes people need to learn how to sit down and calm down. But it's appropriate sometimes to ask people, tell me what's really going on. By the way, uh, um, when God uh, called, now I've got my, my mind's going a mental blank, uh, called Solomon to be king, that's where I'm going with this, called Solomon to be king, uh, and you know that prayer that God asked and, and God said to Solomon you know, in that dream, whatever you want, I will give to you. And in the end, Solomon asked for a hearing heart, a heart that hears, that listens, that perceives things as they really are. And in part, we say that that has to do with empathy today, but it also has to do with developing skill sets of being able to listen carefully to what's going on in someone's life. Uh, it's not always possible to sit down with someone and say, tell me what's really going on, but that's what we need to do when we experience conflict. Now, of course, sometimes people just don't want to listen. And the stuff that's going on in their life and in their heart is so deep and so profound, and they do not want to change. They are comfortable in their situation, which makes other people very uncomfortable. And sometimes there are conflict situations where the only thing you can do is to keep your distance. When we come to our psalm for today, where the psalmist says, Search me, O God, and know my anxious heart, and we reflect on our first reading for today, we realise that very often conflict does have deeper issues attached to it. So today we have that beautiful account of uh, Jacob uh, sleeping out in the scrub and he's so isolated that his pillow is a rock. Have you ever thought about that? The pillow is a rock. How uncomfortable would that be? And I think that sort of alludes to the fact that when Jacob had to flee home, he literally had to flee very quickly, didn't have time to pack everything necessary for a comfortable journey. And you know the backstory to this situation of conflict in the family, which is so multi-layered. Goes right back even to Abraham, and then it goes to Isaac, and then Isaac into Jacob. And when Jacob and Esau are born, the twins of Isaac and Rebekah, um, you will find that there is conflict in that family as well. And conflict between the brothers. And strictly speaking, the older brother was meant to get the inheritance. That's the way things were in those times. The oldest took on the responsibility of caring for all of the, the family members, the extended families, the servants, the slaves, and the wider community had a social responsibility, which is why they got the majority of the inheritance. And of course, you know that Esau treated his inheritance lightly, and Jacob tricked both Esau and his father into gaining that inheritance. And as a result of that conflict, Esau vowed to Jacob that when their father died, he would kill him also so that he would obtain the inheritance back. And so Jacob flees with his mother's blessing. Say, go back to my own family, my own kind, to find someone to be your wife. And of course, from here, um, God makes an incredible promise to Jacob. He says, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. And so here is Jacob fleeing home, a conflict situation. And what does God say to Jacob in this situation. 
He promises him blessing and protection in these situations. When you are in a conflict situation, what is your attitude? What did our Lord say? Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. God said to Jacob in this difficult situation, I will bring you blessing. When someone creates conflict towards you, and they might be totally in the wrong, what is your attitude nevertheless? Will you pray for them? Will you love them? Will you care for them? And of course, that is what our Lord has done for us, isn't it, on the cross? We are God's enemies by nature. We are sinful and unclean. And God loves us and God cares for us in our situation. And so the psalmist is really calling on us to reflect on who we really are. You know how sometimes in conflict when perhaps you're a little bit angry and upset, we have trouble reflecting on who we are and what's going on in our hearts. And so the psalmist says, you have searched me. Lord, you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all of my ways. The Lord searches us and knows us. And that word for search has to do with investigating. And behind it, the root word of it has to do with digging. Uh, and someone playfully said, God digs you. Um, and it's not just that God likes you, but he really knows who you are. And the Lord knows you. And of course, uh, that word for know in the Hebrew, yada, uh, it goes right back to intimate knowledge. When Adam met Eve, Adam knew Eve. Some Bible translations actually say he had sexual intercourse with her. To know is to intimately know, not just to know about, but to know who you are. The Lord knows you. Indeed, God knows you better than yourself. Now, sometimes when we are in conflict situations, we don't want to reflect on the person we most need to reflect on, and that is our own selves. And even sometimes when we are a mediator in another conflict situation, you know, maybe parents with children or somebody who is in a management position at work, and they have to supervise some other people who are in those conflict situations. We also need to know ourselves because even mediators bring an agenda to a conflict situation. And in fact, sometimes can be so determined on achieving an outcome of harmonious relationships at work and put structures in place that the work output will continue but doesn't really deal with the conflict that really exists heart to heart. God knows you better than you know yourself. Which is why in that second reading for today, we have that beautiful word from Paul where he says, therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if the spirit you put, to, but if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For us to operate properly in this world, we need to know our own selves. And the beauty is that in these situations, even in those times when we refuse to acknowledge our own self in a conflict situation, God knows us even better than we know our own selves. O oh Lord, you search me and you know me. Our Lord says that one day everything hidden will be revealed. Every sin, every misdeed, everything you've ever done will be revealed. Imagine everything in your life, every harsh word, everything you've ever done is revealed to people. How would you feel? Every sin, every failing. We well, can't hide any of it from God, can you? He knows you better than you know yourself. He knows your past, he knows your present, he knows your future. He knows that by nature we are sinful and unclean. And yet this word from the Psalms is the word that reminds us of God's incredible love and God's care for us. 
In that reading from Romans where Paul is speaking about the conflict situation that exists within our own selves, between the flesh and the spirit, a conflict that will exist until we take our last breath on this earth. In that situation, Paul also reminds us that we are God's children. And the psalmist says, if I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. You know, the darkest day this earth has ever experienced occurred nearly 2,000 years ago on a Friday afternoon. As Jesus hung on the cross, darkness covered the land from midday till three. When Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. The psalmist says, where can I go from your spirit? The psalmist says, you've searched me, Lord, and you know me. Jacob was running from the darkness of family conflict. Jesus experienced the greatest conflict, not only with people and corrupt authorities, but with sin and death and the power of the devil. Jacob was in the wilderness literally, emotionally and spiritually. Sometimes we might feel like that too. Jesus entered the darkness of death and hell. God opened to Jacob the stairway of heaven and in Christ Jesus our Saviour, God has opened the stairway to heaven for us and for all people. In the darkest of situations you have ever experienced in life, God shines his light. Even the darkness is not dark to you. Think about the difficult situations you have faced in life or are facing. Remember that even the darkest of situation, God shines the light of his love in Christ. In the times of darkness, be it at times of anxiety or the darkness of your sin, rejoice that in Christ that the darkness is not dark, the night is as bright as day. And so, as Paul has said, God touch, God's spirit touches our spirits and confirms who we really are. We know who he is and we know who we are, Father and children. We are called children of God. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? These are words that reminds us that wherever we go, whatever situation we experience in life, God's spirit walks with us, walks with you. No matter the situation you face, God searches you and knows you. And for us, it's very important to hear these words. We let God search us. We let God test us. We let God see us. And we let God lead us. Because his way is the way of light and truth and peace and love. It's a wonderful word, this word from the psalmist, that the Lord searches us and knows us. And the beauty of this word is he does so from the heart of incredible love. He searches you and knows you. And that gives us the ability to reflect on who we have been, who we are, and who we want to be. And of course, who are we? We are God's children. Not only his children by creation, as all people of this earth, but children by redemption through the blood of Christ our Saviour, and his sanctified children through the work of his Spirit in us, in you. As you go through each day of your life on this earth, remember that God makes that promise to walk with you always. Amen. And may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding guard your hearts, your minds, safe in Christ Jesus. Amen.